hello, my name is Carrie Ann Barrett. As you know, I'm a wife, a mom, a counselor, an author of Put Your Crown On. You can find that on Amazon. But more than anything, I'm a child of God. And I'm here with a child of God who is going to tell her story. And I probably stories because she has some amazing ones. She's an anointed minister that's traveled to over 130 countries and has been speaking and ministering for over 40 years. I adore her. She's so sweet. I, I didn't know until I met her how wonderful she is but I've got her here today. So welcome, Nancy Cohen. Well, I'm really glad to be here with you, Carrie. It's an opportunity uh, just to get to spend time with you and so we can get to know one another a little better. And I'm looking forward to uh, sharing with many of the people that are on your, your show. Oh, wonderful. Nancy, I know that you've done a lot, but can you share a little bit about what you're doing and what God, God, is, what God is moving you to do right now? Actually, I've just turned Global Ascension Network over to my daughter, Shannon. Uh, Global Ascension Network has people from all the nations that are actually ascending into the heavens to see what God is doing and then coming back and governmentally decreeing and declaring uh, those things. And, and we can conclusively prove now that they're actually happening within a very short period of time. So that's exciting. We have people from all over the world that join in our Ascension calls. They're on a weekly basis. And we just recently reformatted Global Ascension into what's called a free church. So we had to change the name. So the contact position right now for them is called sons.global. And uh, my daughter is in charge of that. I still do the webinars and some of the teachings and, of course, all of the conferences. But she really takes care of things and she does a really excellent job with it. Her name is Shannon Bates. Uh, when I decided to turn that over to her, I had gotten a, a mandate from the Lord to start something called the Global Strategy Groups for Government, Economy, Technology, Education, Medical Services, Agriculture, uh, arts and creativity, and all of those are now been have now been meeting for about a period of two years. Yeah. And what they are is brainstorming together to see what is this new emerging kingdom going to look like. It's been very, very, very interesting. And we have people from all over the world that are now involved in this. When the Lord first gave me the download or the blueprint for it, it was looked very much like a corporate flow chart. So Jesus was the CEO and down from him were seven lines with seven blocks on each one of those lines, each representing one of the systems in the earth upon which humanity relies for order and structure. And of course, as we know, those systems are shaking all over the world at the present moment, which is much of a result of what happened with COVID. So on each one of those blocks were seven names, and they were the ones who were going to head up the global strategy groups in each one of those areas. Each one of those people has significant number of years of experience in the area that they're working on. And uh, there were several of them that I had known from previous years, other ones I, whose names I had on the blueprint that I hadn't even met yet. And since that time, I've met them through the most amazing, supernatural, miraculous, divine appointments you can even imagine. And so now all of the top level is functioning. Underneath each of one of the seven people in each block, there are also seven other blocks that flow down from them independently. So we're working on the second tier right now. And uh, it's very, very broad based across the earth. And we've got amazing, amazing, amazing things uh, taking place right now through the global strategy groups. So I spend sometimes from four in the morning till two in the morning all day, every day on Zoom, trying to put all of these different groups together and trying to train their leaders uh, in Ascension principles so that they eventually won't need for me to be present. And actually, it's, um, it's all flowing, all working. It's exactly in God's timing. So I'm very, very excited about it. Wow. And you've been traveling. You've, you've met people like these all over the world. You've been traveling. I mean, how did it start here? Do we start with how, how you got <laughs> traveling or, or where you met Jesus in the first place? Uh, how I got started traveling was through a dream. 
Um, I woke up one night uh, in the middle of the night with a dream that the Lord was commissioning me to go to China. At that time, I had pretty much been limited to at-home ministry. I had a deliverance ministry, and this is before deliverance was really even a known thing. So people flew in all over uh, to come to my house for deliverance, and I loved it. I loved what I was doing. I never had any intention or expectation of going international. And one night I had a dream and in this dream, the Lord showed me that he was commissioning me to go to China. At that particular time, my husband and I were in very difficult financial situation because of the shutdown of all the savings and loans in Texas during the eighties. And we really, really were hard pressed for money. So when I woke up in the morning, I said, guess what, honey, God's going to send me to China. And he just laughed and he said, well, that's great. As soon as you have money for a ticket to China, we'll talk about it. Because at that time we were doing good just to feed our children, a little alone, take a trip to China. So that day I had a real estate um, brokerage firm and as long as, as well as um, uh, international import and export company and a commercial contract cleaning service, all of which were big jobs. And uh, I went into my real estate office that morning and pulled out my inbox. And in my inbox was an anonymous cashier's check for exactly to the penny, the amount of a ticket to China. <laughs> so I came wow. home and I told my husband, you said whenever I got the money for a ticket to China. And so he says, well, that's great. But what are you going to go there for? I don't know. What is your purpose? I don't know. Do you know anybody there? No. Do you know where you're going to stay? No. Do you have any idea what cities you're going to? No, I just know I'm going because here's the check. You know, I went ahead and made a ticket to China and I left to go to China with almost no money in my pocket at all. And when I got there, this is before the World Olympics was held there. And China was a little bit scary, especially for a little hometown girl from Texas. That was my first encounter with the persecuted church. And in that particular time era, everything in China was very, very chaotic. So when I got to the airport, the people were like shoulder to shoulder, front to back. They had homeless people sleeping around the edge, stacked up five on top of one another on rice mats. And, and the people were fist fighting, trying to get my luggage to carry my luggage because I looked like a wealthy American, even though I didn't have any money at all. And anyway, after I waited in the airport about four and a half hours, and no, I have no, I have no idea where, where to go or what to do. I've never hailed a rickshaw. I don't have an appoint, a, a, a reservation to stay at any hotel. At that time, nothing in China was written in English. It was all Mandarin Chinese. And of course, I didn't speak a word of Mandarin Chinese. So all of a sudden, I thought to myself, you stupid woman, you should have just listened to your husband. You should have made some plans. You should have contacted some people. You should have made arrangements for where you're going to stay, where you're going to eat, blah, blah. <laughs> anyway. I kind of backed myself into a corner by the elevator and I sunk down in the corner and began to rock back and forth. And I was just praying quite silently in tongues. All of a sudden, this man came up to me and tapped me on the shoulder. And he said, excuse me, ma'am, you wouldn't be from the United States, would you? Well, I was so glad to find anybody who spoke in English. Right. <laughs> I, I was just ecstatic. And I said, well, yes, I am. And he go, comes down closer and he said, you wouldn't be a minister of the gospel, would you? And he's like whispering in my ear. And I said, well, yes, as a matter of fact, I am. He said, your name wouldn't be Nancy Cohen, would it? <laughs> And I said, how did you know? And he goes, oh, praise God. We've been waiting here for you for three days. The Lord gave us a dream and told us that you were coming. Come with me. And so he funneled me right straight into the underground persecuted home cell church system in China. And all of my needs were met for the entire time that I was there. Wow. So it's like amazing, amazing uh, story about how the Lord kind of launched me into international ministry. And from there, things just catapulted around the earth. A lot of it came from uh, ministry that I had in Washington, D.C. 
uh, for 12, I forget if it was 12, 13 years, something like that. I had a ministry in Washington, D.C., and a lot of the ministry was to congressional, dip, congressional people or foreign diplomats from other countries. And we had this farm in Virginia where we would actually take them to entertain them because in the D.C. area, whatever you say gets printed in the newspaper the next day. And we were trying to make a safe haven for them to come and just do nothing but build relationships with one another. And from that, everything exploded and the hinges on the doors all over the earth just blew off because our our primary purpose in setting up those meetings was to see what the national meet, needs of those particular nations were, and then to go and find the resource to meet the need for their country. And this caused very widespread interest. <laughs> so yeah. things just kind of spiraled from there. Wow. And you've had yeah. uh, very many meetings in the White House, I understand. My first one, actually, uh, when I went to the White House, I really didn't even want to go. I, I was invited there for the president's prayer breakfast, which is an annual event. And actually, I tried not to go. It's quite a very interesting story. But Chuck Pierce, I was doing a, a prophetic conference down in his church in Denton, and he grabbed me and just shook me and shook me and shook me and said, and the Lord says, you will go to Washington, D.C., whether you want to or not. And I thought, oh, Lord, I had tried so hard to get out of going to that meeting. Yeah. But he made it quite clear in many different ways that he had divine appointments for me to go there. So I surrendered and I went. But I'm sitting at the president's prayer breakfast all the time, not in a very good attitude, thinking, Man, I could be home casting out demons. What am I doing here with all these political people? Wow. <laughs> and uh, anyway, to make a long story short, on that particular visit, he set up some of the most dynamic meetings that I've ever been in before, or even to this day. And the testimonies that came out of that particular first visit to Washington, D.C. are really, really amazing and actually i'm i'm writing several of them down in my second book which is called called uh walking the limitless life so the first book is limitless and it gives um testimonies of different things that have happened in foreign nations where i really really was uh, blessed by god with limitless energy in order to be able to accomplish purposes high and far above anything that is humanly uh, possible. I understood, Nancy, that you've been able to preach for, for like days without food and water? Yep, yep. Even in, in India one time, the Lord gave me a mandate to prophesy over 10,000 orphans. And they were living in a city that was raised up and built by an American philanthropist. And they, many of them had given their life to the Lord because they were taken out of extreme levels of poverty off of the streets of Bombay and Calcutta. And when they came in, they were in really bad shape. But because of the care of the people that were there, they had given their life to the Lord. And so the Lord said uh, he wanted me to prophesy over all 10,000 of those orphans. And I left and I said, Father, you know, I'm not a short prophesier, right? I don't just say, God's going to bless you. He's going to give you a business. He's going to prosper. I said, I go all the way back into their generations. So uh, he just laughed back and he said, you think I'm not able to empower you to do the thing that I ask you to do? And so sure enough, for 10 days, 24 hours around the clock, I ministered the prophetic to all of these orphans. And in 10 days, I never had a bite to eat, never had a drink of water, never went to the bathroom even. And one time I had a doctor come to me and he said, that's humanly impossible. Nobody can go 10 days without going to the bathroom. It's humanly impossible. And I said, exactly, because it's not human, it's spirit. And wow. spirit doesn't have to go to the bathroom. I don't know how to tell you. That's pretty big for people. I mean, I've heard of people fasting for, you know, 40 days almost, but not, not going to the bathroom. Mm -hmm. Well, the thing of it is, is 
I think that what the Lord was doing was showing us a, a kind of a precursory example of how we're going to begin to function when we really tap out of the 10% limitation of how we functioned in the age of the church and begin to tap into the hundredfold, which is a kingdom, um, kingdom functionability, which is radically different than that which we've been normally used to. So I think he was just using it as, a, as an example of the things we can do, because when our spirit begins to take control over our soul and our body, um, it, it, we really don't need all of the things that we think we need. You just mentioned fasting. So for 10 years, twice a year, I did a 40 day water fast on water only with no juice, no vegetables, nothing. And um, it really does do something to you in a spiritual way that brings you into the higher heights and the deeper depths. Mm -hmm. So we, we can do those things. The problem is our body doesn't like it very well when we do because our soul and our body have been in control a long time. So when he takes over and our spirit is put back into the governing position over our soul and our body, we'll find out we really don't have need of all the things we think that we do mm -hmm. under normal circumstances. Yeah. Amen. Oh, now, Nancy, you've definitely done some interesting ministry outside of the norm can you share some stories about how you've kind of walked in that kingdom mentality and changed, changed up some lives? <laughs> well, there's, there's tons of testimonies for that, uh, that purpose. I think one that really sticks in my mind was I was in a, a nation one time where you could actually get your throat slit for even saying the name of Jesus Christ. But I won the national leader to the Lord, and he gave me permission to do some street ministry. And he actually even sent uh, people from the army to protect me against any brutality that might come. Uh, so we opened up a little bit of a street ministry in this area. On the first day, we had mostly women and children, not very many, because the men knew that if they showed up at a Christian meeting, they're probably going to lose their jobs. So on the first day, we just had I don't know, a couple hundred people, maybe, and we had good worship, good praise and worship, a good message, good altar ministry. Some people got saved. Some people got delivered. Some people got healed. But it was still just kind of so-so. On the second day, many of them went and told their friends and told their families about what happened. And so our, our people almost doubled on the second day. And on the second day, we had more good praise and worship, another message, a good altar call, and more people got saved and healed and delivered. But on the third day, um, a couple of the mullahs from the local area brought in a little boy who was dead, and he'd been dead for four days. And they had him on a, on a kind of a two by eight piece of wood with a sheet draped over the top of him. And they brought him right down to the altar and threw him down at my feet and turned around in their own native language. And what they said was the church of Christ has no power. And when I looked down at this little boy that was laying dead on the floor, the Lord did a really interesting thing, which today I understand far better. He drew the veil away from my eyes. And instead of seeing that little boy lying dead on the floor, I saw my own grandson. And now, you know, when you, when you're praying for your own, you can pray all the way from your toenails. And my grandson was the delight of my life. So I reached down and I grabbed this young boy and I began rocking back and forth and wailing and groaning and moaning. And I poured a whole quart of water over his head. I poured a whole quart of oil over his head. I had the altar people stand him up and I slapped him in the face back and forth and I forced open his jaw and breathed into his mouth. And lo and behold, the Lord raised the little boy from the dead, which was a good thing, but that's not the best thing. What happened after that was all of the people got up and they ran out and they began to cry 
come and see, come and see. The little boy who was dead is alive again. And suddenly people were flowing in from everywhere and they were bringing all of their sick, all of their, they brought in children who had been brain damaged at birth that had never, ever walked or spoken a word. And they came in with all these machines attached to them and kids who had their muscles were so atrophied because they'd never walked. Some of them were eight to 10 years old, never been out of a bed in their entire life. And the Lord renewed all of their muscles. They got up and jumped around and waving their hands and just praising the Lord in in unintelligible language because they'd never learned how to speak. We had people who came in with no eyes. Their eyes had actually been cut out of their head. And the Lord formed new eyes and gave them 20-20 sight. We had uh, some of the most amazing miracles that you can uh, even imagine. And we tapped into something that night called dominion in the area of healing. And what that means is every single solitary person who came got healed. We had this one little girl, she's my favorite story, one of my favorite stories, because in their city, they sequestered all of the Christians to live in one particular area so that they couldn't proselytize all the Muslims. And in this particular area, it was very, very poor. They They could hardly get enough food to eat. One night in the middle of the night, the army Uh, circled this particular area, doused all of the houses with jet fuel and burned up 16,000 people. And you never saw that in a headline anywhere. But this 16,000 people out of all of them, as far as they knew, only three or four had actually escaped all of that. And one of them was this little girl. She was about eight years old. And she uh, she escaped through the police cordon and ran to her grandmother's house, who lived outside the village in a little wood. She had been burned from her chin all the way down to her knees, and she had huge bubble blisters all over her body. When she got to her grandmother's house, her grandmother, who was an older woman, and at that time, people of her age, were uh, women, were never allowed to be educated, And it was against the law for a Muslim doctor to administrate medicine to a Christian. So this mother, uh, grandmother, didn't have any idea what to do. So she took a sheet and she wrapped this little girl around her body and her arms actually grafted to the side of her body. The The skin grafted back in. She had eight of her fingers were burned off to the first knuckle. So she was only had two little teeny tiny fingers that she could move at the side of her body because her arms were grafted to the side of her body. And God did such an awesome, wonderful thing for this little girl. He did supernatural surgery, severed her arms from her body, grew back all of her fingers, gave her new skin from her chin all the way down to her knees And she was just running around praising God, lifting her hands and waving and praising uh, the Lord. We had uh, people that were amputated, had amputated limbs, whose limbs were grown back. We had people that were deaf, that regained their hearing. There were so many miracles at that one particular uh, meeting. Afterwards, after the meeting was over, I went back to my hotel And I was just, uh, I was just so exalting the Lord. And I said, oh, Lord, this is so good. This is so huge. This is so powerful. We actually tapped into dominion in the area of healing. And he just laughed. Yeah. And actually, (laughs) to tell you the truth, I was a little bit offended because I'm thinking if I'm raising the dead, that must mean I'm pretty mature, you know. Anyway, I I said, Lord, don't you get it? You know, the little boy uh, was raised from the dead. The mullahs who brought him gave their life to the Lord. We tapped into dominion. It's so great and so powerful. And all of a sudden, he thrust me into what I call a living vision, where I'm a part of the vision. And I'm like a three-year-old little girl. And I've dressed up in all of my mother's clothes and I've got this great big, huge organdy dress and I'm stumbling over the dress. I've got pearls around my neck, lipstick smeared all over my face, this crazy little hat with this little floppy flower in the front of it. But the amazing thing about the dream is I have these little teeny tiny 
feet in these great big, huge six inch stiletto heels. And my ankles are, are, are collapsing one way or the other. I'm tripping over my mother's dress. And I'm thinking, Lord, what does this have to do with the little boy being raised from the dead? With the moolah, uh, moolahs giving their life to the Lord. With tap, What does this have to do with tapping into dominion in the area of healing? And he said, and this is a universal word. This is not just a word for me because all I am is just a catalyst and a mouthpiece. The word was, I would not that you would continue to lay again the foundation of the first principles of Christ Jesus. This is Hebrews chapter six, Mm -hmm. repentance of dead works, the baptisms, laying on of hands, healing, resurrection from the dead, faith towards God and the doctrine of eternal judgment. Set these things aside now and come up, come up to perfection. Resurrection from the dead is kindergarten play compared to the kinds of things that he's preparing for us to do in this hour. And I thought to myself, okay, Lord, (laughs) if resurrection from the dead is kindergarten stuff, I think we have a long way to go yet. (laughs) Right. So, so then what, right. Then what is it the left to do? What after what, what comes after that? Yeah. So many, many, uh, now I've never seen that measure of dominion in the area of healing again. And I think probably it was because the little boy was raised from the dead, which brought the faith level and the expectancy of the crowd to a much higher level. They were expecting more because they saw the little boy raised from the dead. Right. So oh, the word says all of creation is groaning for the manifestation of the sons of the living God, which we are. Not only they are groaning, we ourselves are groaning within ourselves for what? Redemption of the body. So see, the, the, the whole thing has to do with us moving out of a very childlike state Uh, growing up into the fullness of the measure of the stature of Christ Jesus. So that dominion and healing meeting was just a precursor of things that are about ready to unfold. And the, I, I always tell people, whenever I share my stories, I don't want people to think that I'm some kind of high powered prophetic person who has such a level of anointing. All I am, I I really don't have any more anointing than anybody that would be listening to this. It's just that I have 40 years worth of surrendered experience. (laughs) Right. So you also, you went, you decided to go and it sounds like you went and were like, whatever, I'll just do it. Whatever you say, God. Pretty much. That's my ministry motto. I'll go where he tells me to go. I'll do what he tells me to do. I'll say what he tells me to say, and I'll be what he tells me to be. A lot of people come to me and they say, that's too broad of a statement. And I said, no, if I add or subtract any one word of that, it makes it less than what it really is, because that's what I do. I just go where he tells me to go. I just do what he tells me to do. And that's what what I feel like is the strength of the ministry is I don't preconceive much. And if he wakes up one day and says, go to Afghanistan or Saudi Arabia or Iran or Iraq, I'm on a plane the next day because I have learned that when he says to go, he goes in advance, he opens the door, he prepares the way. And I'm just as safe being right there as I am here. So Nancy, is it our doubt that gets in the way? What gets in the way? Probably nothing. And actually, the the issue of doubt and fear are are things that I have to deal with a lot because of going to places like the cannibals and the headhunters and the people who chop the heads off of 6,000 men in one day. I've been to some of the worst hell holes in the world, literally. And I'm not really afraid. And, and people say, aren't you afraid? You know, the cannibals still eat people and the headhunters still chop people's heads off. And I said, not really, because whether I live or whether I die is not what matters. What matters is, did I complete the purpose for which I was sent? So if they chop me up in a million pieces and throw me in the soup and the next day they all give their life to the Lord, I'm victorious. And whether I'm here or whether I'm there, I'm still victorious. 
So another thing too, I mentioned to you before, was one of the keys to getting free of doubt and unbelief is fasting. So when Jesus was on the mountain of Mount of Transfiguration, and he came down the mountain, the scribes and the Pharisees and disciples were having an argument. And this little boy is flip flopping around on the ground, having massive seizures. And the father comes to the Lord and says, Lord, Lord, my son is sore vexed, for he falls into the water one moment, into the fire the next moment. And I brought him to your disciples that your disciples should cast out the demons, but they could not. And Jesus spun around to his own hand-picked disciples. And he said, you wicked and perverse generation, how long do I have to be with you before you understand? He turned and rebuked the demons and the boy was made whole from that moment. Afterwards, the disciples came to him because they'd already cast out demons and they'd already healed the sick. And they said, Lord, Lord, why couldn't we cast out those demons? And he said, because of your doubt and your unbelief, this kind only comes out by prayer and fasting. A lot of people think he was able to set the boy free from the demonic that was, uh, was torturing him. But it's not that. It's the doubt and the unbelief in his own disciples. This kind only comes out by prayer and fasting. You're saying it's not the demon that needed to come out by prayer and fasting, but the no, doubt. it's the doubt and unbelief that was in his own disciples. So the issue is many of us feel like we don't have any doubt or any unbelief at all. But the truth of the matter is, is if you watch what happens, even in the age of the church, when people run to the altar for prayer, people will gather around someone who has an ulcer or a migraine headache. But you let a quadriplegic roll his chair down to the altar and see how many people throng to him. The issue is, what if I lay hands on him and pray for him and he doesn't get healed? Okay. So the word says, that's, that's actually a bit of doubt. Basically, the doubt and unbelief is the thing that the prayer and fasting deals with. And that's one of the reasons why for 10 years, I did two 40-day water fasts every year. So I wouldn't have that problem because... I've been in many, many, many life and death situations where people came to kill me, chop my head off or spear me to death. One, I, I led this cartel dealer one time in Mexico to the Lord, and he went out in his yard that day and burned up $50 million worth of drugs. And a, actually, the cartel didn't like that so well. So they put out a contract on him, and they, they came to his house while I was still there. And they had these sawed off shotguns. <laughs> they took the, this one guy takes this sawed off shotgun and he sticks it right here in my head. And he goes, lady, I'm here to kill you. And I just laughed and I said, you can't kill me. I'm already dead. <laughs> <laughs> and this guy looked at me and he said, what? So he tried to pull the trigger and it, and it locked. And he pulled the butt back again, tried again, and it locked again. And the third time he pulled it back, tried to shoot it again and it locked again. It scared him so bad. He gave his life to the Lord and, he and the wow. cartel dealer are going all over Mexico today, preaching, preaching the gospel. <laughs> wow. So Nancy, when people hear the, the Lord or they think they hear the Lord, how do they know? And how do they clarify with God? Does he really want you to go to China? Does he really want you to you know, be so bold or what, what is he calling you to do? How do they know? Well, I think in the very beginning, for all of us, we question that. I, I myself did that. When he first started to operate in me through the prophetic, I had never had any training in the prophetic. And I was a seer long before I gave my life to Jesus. Even as a little child, I saw a lot of stuff. And I tried to force it away because I didn't like it. And it made me very, very uncomfortable. So when the Lord reactivated that gift back in me so that it could be of benefit to humanity, I uh, every time I would, in the very beginning, I'd get in the pulpit and somebody would say, Nancy's coming to prophesy over everybody in our church. I'm going, no, no, I didn't do that. I just came to teach a lesson. That's it, you know? And then I would say, I, I would find myself saying, how do I know if it's really God? How do I know if it's, if it's really only my own thoughts? How do I know if it could be the devil? You know, he could be making me do this stuff to make God look bad or whatever. 
And one time, the very first time that this happened, the Lord, he just laughed at me. He always laughs like I'm some kind of cute little three-year-old girl out there trying to work things out. But anyway, he said, well, do you believe my word? And I said, yes, Lord. He said, do you believe that whatever things you bind on heaven and earth, whatever things you bind in, in heaven are bound in earth? Yes. Do you believe that whatever you loose in heaven is loosed in the earth? Yes, I believe it. Your word says that. And I've seen demons coming out. I know it's true. And he said, do you believe, do you believe, really believe that whatsoever things you ask in my name, believing and not doubting, you shall have it. And I said, yes, Lord, your word is very clear about that. And he said, okay, close your eyes and open your mouth and trust that whatever comes out of your mouth is from me because you've already gagged and bound the enemy. He can't speak through you. No other spirit can speak through you, but your spirit and my spirit. You've asked whatever you want in the name of Jesus, believing and not doubting. Just open your mouth and trust whatever comes out of your mouth. It'll be from me. And the first time I ever did this, <laughs> I was standing at this, and I didn't go to this church to even do this. And there was no training in the prophetic whenever this was happening. So when the pastor got in the pulpit and he said, anybody who needs a prophetic word, come forth. Well, this was in a church of 28,000 people. <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, God, what am I going to do? And they would all rush to the altar and I'd be standing there. I didn't see anything. I didn't hear anything. So I re reached out my hand to this first woman and I just did what the Lord said. I just closed my eyes and I saw a potter's wheel. And on this potter's wheel, I saw this lump of clay and the potter's the potter's hands were forming this, this chunk of clay. And all of a sudden, he takes the chunk of clay and he throws it on the floor and smashes it into a bunch of people. And this lady, I'm prophesying over, she goes, yes, 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 that's it. Oh my God, that's God. And I thought, it is? Really? Okay. So I saw him pick it up, put it back on the potter's wheel, begin to reshape it. And then he took it again and threw it on the floor and, and broke it all up. And she goes, yes, yes, that's God, that's God. And I'm, I'm thinking to myself, this is making no sense to me at all. And in fact, it doesn't look like a really good thing because he's smashing all this clay and, and it's falling into all these pieces. After I got done with the whole thing, this is my first time ever to prophesy in a public arena. She turned around, she took the microphone. She goes, this lady doesn't know this, but I have a business. And the name of my business is called The Potter's Wheel. She said she doesn't understand what she was saying, but I understand exactly because I'm in that same process that when the Lord is extracting things from your character that will hinder or um, delay or defer the cause or plan of Christ for your life, he has to break it apart and begin to remold it all. So, you know, um, the answer to your question from my viewpoint is this. I always ask the Lord, Lord, give me, I surrender my tongue. I surrender my mouth. I surrender my body to you. I just lay down my own thoughts, my own expectations. And in the powerful, magnificent name of Jesus, I just ask you to speak to me and through me to bless your people. I gag and bind and render any other spirit, but my spirit and your spirit from speaking here. And I thank you that you will do it. For this is your word and your way and your will. In Christ Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. And then whatever comes out, oh my gosh. Sometimes it so stuns me because it's never what I expect. And it's always what they had the greatest need of hearing for that moment. So uh, it sets aside all preconceptions, all thought that you might be making it up. You might be speaking it out of your own will or whatever, because for 40 years, I've seen its effectiveness. And he, after a while, it's kind of like you with your husband. When you first meet your husband, the first time he calls you for a date, you say, who is this? And then the more time that you spend together, the more you don't have to ask who it is, because you just recognize their voice. Right. And not only that, but when the longer that you've been married, you sometimes don't even have to communicate because you can read their body language in such a way that you know exactly what they have need of before they even ask. So the issue to finding out, is it me? Is it, is it my 
my own thoughts, or is it really God? It's just mm -hmm. a simple little prayer. And just believe that whatsoever things you ask in his name, believing and not doubting, that's the issue. It isn't how much faith you have. It's how little doubt you have. You can, you can move mountains with just as much faith as a grain of mustard seed. But the Lord says, let those who doubt in their heart not think they'll ever receive anything from me. So it's how little doubt you have. That's why it says, whatsoever things you ask in my name, believing and not doubting, you shall have it. <laughs> mm. People struggle with the difference between faith and doubt. Nancy, can you just clarify the difference? Mm. Well, faith comes from God. Doubt comes from the enemy. Mm. Uh, a lot of times, and, and, and unbelief is really coupled with doubt. And actually, doubt is, was the original sin. So when, when Satan said to Eve in the garden, did God really say, did he really say that if you eat of that tree, you'll die? So basically what he was doing was he was infusing, infusing doubt and doubt leads to unbelief and unbelief leads to failure because uh, whatever things we ask, not believing or not, uh, uh, or, or doubting, we're not going to receive it. His word is clear about that. So anyway, is it like a second guessing then they go, oh, he's going to do it. Well, I don't know. Maybe he won't. <laughs> I don't know. Pretty much. I think when once people <clears throat> learn to just listen and do whatever it is he says to do after a while, your experience will prove out that it is his voice and that whatever you hear him saying he's well capable of doing, even if it's above and beyond anything that would be in your wildest expectations, because he's done amazing, amazing things. Yeah. And so today I just don't even, I, I just don't doubt that when he tells me go somewhere, I just go. And no matter what the consequence is, and no matter how hard it is to get there or to, to do the thing that he asked me to do, I know that he'll never, that he, wherever he guides, he provides and, and, and that provision is not just financial, it's mental, emotional, physical, spiritual, in, in every way. He provides everything that you have need of to fulfill the, the request that he makes. Amen. That more of us would believe that and not doubt. <laughs> what, what more would we do, you know, uh, more than kindergarten, as you said. Yeah, <laughs> that's it. That's what he, he's shown me several times since then, that what we think is spiritual maturity is very, very small compared to the level of functionality that he's desiring to take us into. Mm. So it's a great day, a good time to be alive. Amen. Now, Nancy, I've, I've been focused on the United States. I know you're all over the world, but I'm mm -hmm. in the United States. What are, you, what are you seeing in the spirit in the United States? Mm. That's a hard, hard question to answer. The one thing that I know is in the end, working out, working of all things. And I know that this is going to oppose a lot of people's feelings. But when his kingdom really is established on the earth, there'll be no such thing as the United States, Iran, Iraq, Israel, or Africa, South Africa will all become one in him. And all of those boundaries, which are man-made boundaries, are going to be completely obliterated. Because as we move into the fullness of the measure of the stature of Christ, we begin to realize that our, our identity is not limited to our nationality, uh, to our social status, to our uh, gender, to our, our heredity. It's all... Uh, our only identity becomes him. Mm -hmm. And therefore we look at the world in a whole lot different way when we're looking from the heavens downward than we do from the earth upward. So the one thing that I do know is he knows the plans he has for us that they're for good and not for evil for a future and a great, great hope, whether that's as an American or as a stranger alien and pilgrim here, I don't, I don't say because the things that are coming uh, are quite difficult to discuss. And I really, 
but the ultimate end of it all is the most glorious thing that has ever happened since the beginning of all creation because it is his kingdom coming to this earth is so long as we will take the initiative to establish the kingdom within first when that kingdom comes we'll have governing power like we never ever believed or thought possible so the things that he's opening up to us right now the doors that he's opening are truly truly amazing and some of the things that are taking place are above and beyond even our wildest imaginations so his word says your eye has not yet seen your ear has not yet heard neither has it entered into your heart or to your mind the great huge magnificent things i have planned for you it has not yet been revealed what you shall be but when you see me as i am then you shall be like me mm -hmm. so the the issue is he's we've now migrated out of the age of the church not that the church is ending the church is eternal but the limitation under which we've been operating in the age of the church is now being expanded because we're leaving behind infancy and juvenility and we're actually growing up into the into the maturity that he desires for us to walk in so he can now begin to release greater levels of functionality in us he couldn't do that until we had been sufficiently dealt with by the cross because it would be no different than say you having a three-year-old child that came to you and said hey mom i want the keys to the car are you going to give them the keys to the car i don't think so because you know they're not yet responsible enough to handle that measure of power he is the same way he cannot give us more power than he knows that we will responsibly be able to handle and the more responsibility that we take and the more that we uh, oversee well the power that he gives us the greater measure of the power that comes later so those things are happening right now and it really is amazing to see all across the earth it's happening everywhere mm -hmm. that the consciousness and the awareness of humanity is being elevated to a place where they can actually understand in a far higher deeper way their need for him mm -hmm. Amen. And the reality of his kingdom and what he what he says about us yeah yep Amen. it's true wow thank you nancy for sharing your stories it's always yep, a pleasure yep. to connect with you <laughs> uh, where can people find you again the website is called sons.global and we also still carry the website global ascension network.net and that one will drive you to sons.global on the sons.global we have the uh the option of people joining weekly ascension groups they're all over the world and we have some of them that have as many as 10 different nations all represented in one group uh, then uh, on the website i also carry teachings that i never uh, put on the internet and the reason for that is for people to hear some of those teachings would be a greater stumbling block Mm -hmm. then it would be a help because people have to be to the place where their greatest intentionality is to seek union with the divine nature um so uh on the website i think we have somewhere around 60 different teachings that go into uh a lot of the things that the lord is doing to open up the nations and the people in the earth at the present moment um, also, they can uh, on the website or on Amazon, either one, they can get my book, which is called Limitless and Limitless has, I don't know, maybe 50 or 60 different testimonies of miraculous things that the Lord has done in the earth in regards to pressing us beyond the boundaries of our earthly limitation and the, the boundaries of the gravitational pull of earth to understand that we can do way more from the heavenly realms downward than we can from the earth upward. Mm -hmm. That's why Jesus himself said in John chapter five, I of my own self can do nothing, only that which I see my father doing. I don't speak of my own self. I only speak that which I hear my father saying. 
So if Jesus of his own self could do nothing but what he saw the Father doing, how do we think we can accomplish anything of eternal purpose if we can't ascend into the heavens and see what the Father's doing? Mm. So the the issue is in terms of when when the, the word says, when you see me as in a mirror reflected, you shall know me as well as I know you. That's a big, big statement, because what does he know about us? How many, uh, every word we speak, every action we take, every thought we think, mm. how many cells are in our body, how many hairs are on our head? He says, that's how well he knows us. And when we are caught up into the heavens to see him face to face, eye to eye, I'm telling you, when you feel his breath on your cheek and you hear his whispers in your ear, the things of this earth grow strangely dim. And the things that seem so empirically important all of a sudden just melt into nothingness compared with the awesome, magnificent wonder of just being in his presence. So the more that we ascend and see him face to face, the more like him we can become. Mm, Wow, that we would all connect and uh, encounter him in that way, Nancy. Thank you so much for sharing your stories today. Thank you for teaching us a little bit more about what you've learned over the many years of travel and with the Lord. Well, thank you for having me, Carrie. I would look forward to having you come on our show sometime, maybe after you get done with your thing in Massachusetts. That'd be awesome. So keep us advised about what happens with that. And we'll look forward to a good report. That sounds wonderful. Thank you, Nancy. And everyone who's watching. Thank you. Have a great day. God bless you. Thank you, Nancy. It's been wonderful to have you on this show. Thank you for sharing all your stories for God's glory. Look, everyone, like, share, and subscribe, because this is the stuff that people need to hear, the reality of the king and his kingdom, and that he talks to us, and that we can have faith and move mountains. Have a blessed day.